Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforumoneword.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Marcia Zimmerman, and I'm the senior rabbi of Temple Israel of Minneapolis, a guest moderator of today's forum with Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace is a public theologian, social activist, best-selling author, and international commentator on ethics and public life. He is founder and leader of Sojourners, an organization committed to putting faith into action for social justice, and the editor-in-chief of Sojourners magazine. He teaches at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and currently serves on the Global Agenda Council on Values of the World Economic Forum. A prolific writer, he is the author of 12 books, including The Uncommon Good and Rediscovering Values, A Guide for Economic and Moral Recovery. His latest book and the timely topic of today's presentation is America's Original Sin, Racism, White Privilege, and the Bridge to a New America. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back for a third visit to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Jim Wallace. Thank you very much. I'm always glad to come back to the Westminster Town Hall Forum because it brings me back to Minnesota. And I always love being with you all here in Minnesota. I want to thank Rabbi Marcia Zimmerman for being our moder moderator today. And we were just talking back there, and there was another woman rabbi in Chicago who was very involved with our events. Turns out you're like best friends. And it, and it struck me how uh, is a number of women clergy who've been very involved in all these town meetings across the country that we're having. And uh, Tracy Blackman from Ferguson, I talk about in the book, who took, who took the faith community into the streets along with the young people who were there. A young black clergy woman I met yesterday here in the Twin Cities who talked about the need to change the imagination change the narrative of this whole conversation. So all these w women clergy telling me things I'm learning from reminded me of my wife, Joy Carroll, back home in Washington I talked to last night about all this. And I thought I'd tell you a story about how, how she is changing the imagination and narrative even in her own family. So Joy and I met at this uh, big music festival, Greenbelt in the UK many years ago. Joy is one of the first women ordained in the Church of England many years back, and uh, we met there and married and then came back to speak at that place with our young son, Luke. And so Luke was four years old, sitting in my lap, and he looked up and he saw his mother celebrating the Eucharist for 25,000 British young people. And he watched his mom and watched them, and they're kind of doing whatever she tells them to. She says something, they say something back, and she's, he's watching all this, his mom, this big stage, and she, he said to me, Dad, can, can men do that too? <laughs> she's changing the, the narrative for the young men in my family, and that's what we're gonna try and do today. The media today is obsessed with the state of the race, the 
political race, the horse race. But our conversation is about the state of race in America in 2016, and even how it's shaping the race politically. This is a deeper, more difficult, but ultimately more hopeful conversation. And I want to try and go deeper today because 250 years of slavery, 100 years of legal segregation, discrimination, as Brian Stevenson says, who's been here to this forum, terrorist violence against black lives and bodies, 50 years of a civil rights movement, seven years of a black president, and politics hasn't cleansed us of this sin. We are not a post-racial society. And so we've been turning this book tour into a town meeting tour, and I often speak in this book about parables. Jesus talked in parables, stories that were meant to teach lessons, learn the right lessons from the parables. So we're going to places that really have become parables. Baltimore the first week, New York, D.C., and then Chicago most of this week, which has become such a parable. Ferguson on Sunday, and here in the Twin Cities, you have also now become a parable for these questions. How do we go deeper? And I'm invoking across our traditions the language of sin and repentance, which has meaning across our traditions. Some rabbis and imams were telling me in Chicago that repentance in their traditions means what it does in my Christian one, which is it's not just about feeling sorry and hanging your head. It's about turning around and going in a whole different direction with changes in behavior, action, practices, and policies. Timely is right, as Marcia said, we knew this book would be painfully timely. And sure enough, we have Flint, just up the road from my hometown of Detroit. And that parable teaches us the lesson that racism is in the air we breathe and the water that we drink. It's systemic. It goes to the root. And so I began with this provocative title. I agree it is, and I was told this all week last week, America's Original Sin. But you see, it isn't just the slavery. We've had, we had slaveries before. I mean, the Romans had Greek slaves, and those slaves were tutoring their elite children. They respected them. They didn't rip their families apart. They never would have said anything to dehumanize them. They, were, they lost a war. They were slaves. But you see, we couldn't do that, and particularly I want to take responsibility in a church the Christians, the British and American Christians couldn't do that because, you see, our faith was incompatible with what we were about to do to these Africans and create out of them the most important economic resource in our nation's founding. But you can't treat people you want to make into chattel property like Imago Dei, the image of God. You gotta throw away Imago Dei and say that they are less than human, to say from the founding that black lives matter less than white lives. So the founding of the nation wasn't all men are created equal, whatever that means, whoever they meant to include, and we're just moving toward a more perfect union. No, no, it was foundational to us that black lives matter less than white lives. So 
Brittany Packnett, another emerging woman leader from Ferguson who is one of the most articulate leaders there, she said to me this, she said, in the Black Lives Matter movement, we don't just need allies, we need accomplices. Accomplices. So today I want to ask, what does it mean for us to be accomplices? Accomplices. This um, original sin uh, is also an ideology we created to justify slavery, and I would suggest that it also is in the faith community. It's an idol. I can speak today about the idolatry of white Christianity. That the idol of whiteness has, I believe, in my tradition, separated white Christians from God. It's an idol. And we have to understand this, 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 this uh, line of Jesus I love so much is the introduction, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does it mean to be set free from our idolatries. We try to unpack in the book what that title means and, and how the Black Lives Matter movement goes right to the heart of this original sin. I learned from black clergy a long time ago when I was a kid coming up. I learned from them in the streets how in fact, what it means that black lives matter. This conversation has been going on a long time but now it's becoming a broader conversation. And I want to give credit to those young people in Ferguson who, uh, who night after night went out to the streets when they weren't popular, when they weren't being supported, when they weren't safe, they're risking their lives. And if they hadn't done that, done that heavy lifting, night after night, there wouldn't have been a Department of Justice report confirming everything they were saying a Ferguson commission, or a policing commission now that is very practical about how we can change the racialized policing in this nation. And there wouldn't be this conversation we're having, which is quite incredible. In the last three weeks, it is multiracial, it is intergenerational, it is interfaith and secular, it is, it is older veteran leaders and young emerging leaders. It is, it is academics and activists. It is an amazing conversation that I'm getting to witness across this nation. And that provides us, I think, a profound opportunity. Again, repentance is not just feeling sorry and hanging your head. It's saying, we're going in the wrong direction. How do we turn around and now go in a whole different direction? and change our behavior. How to become accomplices. Now, it is systemic, and, and many in this room know that it is systemic in not just our policing, but in our criminal justice systems, our educational systems, and our economic systems and if you think it's just old and historical, the young man I met in Ferguson uh, said to me, I, I, I still feel like I'm treated like only three-fifths of a person. Black teenage boy in 2015 feeling the existential meaning of that shameful three-fifths compromise we put in the Constitution. And of course, as a protester, He's always asked, what do you want? <laughs> so we always get protesting. What do you want? He said, I, I want an education. Um, I want a job. I want a family. I want an education. I want a job. I want a family. My son Luke's going to college next year. He was considering McAllister for a while. Good school. And he wants an education, a job, and a family. So while this is systemic, I think it's got to get personal for each of us. So I decided to write this book after Trayvon Martin was shot and killed. And I remember the story. 
I mean, this has been happening for so long, such a long time, but somehow this story and some others began to break through. And we heard the story, and I looked at my son, Luke, who is the same age as Trayvon Martin, big six-foot-tall varsity athlete, and I realized my lament as a white father was that the whole nation knows, the whole country knows, that if my son Luke had been in Sanford, Florida, same time, same place, doing the same things Trayvon Martin was doing, everyone knows, we all know he'd have come back to me and Joy. We all know that, but he didn't come back to his mom and dad. He's not going to college next year. Because my wife's a Brit, we were in England over the holidays, and uh, my 12-year-old son, Jack, was really anxious to tell all his family and friends that he's five foot seven and a half. Half's very important. Five, seven and a half. And, and they all said, Jack, you look so big and strong and athletic, so impressive. Nobody said, Jack, you look threatening. While we were there, the news came across the pond that the Cleveland police officer who killed Tamer Rice would face no trial, would not be held accountable. And sitting on a couch in London next to my son Jack, I read the words of the prosecutor who wanted us to know that, that this 12-year-old was a larger than average. 12. He was big, he was tall, he was five foot seven and a half. Do we think that my son, Jack Wallace, in that park in Cleveland, even holding a toy gun, which by the way has, has uh, open carry, conceal and carry laws, you can carry guns around there, that a police officer would have come up to my son, Jack, and shot him in two seconds before speaking to him? Does anybody really think that? So how do we take what is systemic and make it personal? Brian Stevenson writes in the foreword to the book, the first paragraph of his essay, which is worth reading all by itself, um, talks about a story he had shared with me before. He's going home in Atlanta to his house, nation's leading, I would say, premier incarceration lawyer. League of Briefs all over the front seat, long day, tired day, and he just lists some music at the end of the day, parks and just puts his head back. Just to be quiet for a minute and listen to Sly. <laughs> Banging on the window, looks up. There's a police officer with a gun saying, get out of the effing car, I'll blow your effing head off. Ryan gets out, I'm a lawyer, hands up. Spread eagle over the car in front of his house. This is Brian Stevenson, Harvard lawyer, Supreme Court lawyer. And when the cop finally realizes he is not, that he's a lawyer and all of that, he doesn't say he's sorry, he just says, you're lucky this time. Systemic. I got asked on the road about affirmative action. How do you feel about affirmative action? I said, well, Pretty good, as a white baby boomer, I was the beneficiary of the biggest affirmative action program in our government's history. After World War II, my dad, naval veteran, came home and all the veterans, they got a GI Bill, that's free education. FHA loan, that's a house. Education house makes you middle class. The government made my family middle class. Whole neighborhood, three bedroom houses with veterans, and white veterans got that, and black veterans didn't get that. Systemic. White baby boomer, beneficiary of white privilege. Now, the book talks about how it's racial geography that has often separated us, and 35 percent, I'm sorry, 75 percent. I learned in this research, 75% of us white Americans, or as Ta-Nehisi Coates describes us well, those Americans who think they are white. 
75% of us as white Americans have no significant black relationships in our social circle. So I wasn't surprised when I saw a survey that said 72% of white evangelicals, white Catholics, white mainline Protestants, white Christians, 72% believe that these shootings are, quote, isolated incidents. While 82% of black Protestants, black Christians, say they're, no, they're part of, quote, a pattern, a pattern in their lives. Now, I'm a little league baseball coach, been 22 seasons, 11 years, big part of my life, and I want to tell you, every black player I have ever coached has had his dad or his mom have the talk, how to behave or not to behave in the presence of a police officer or any white man with a gun. The talk, they've all had the talk, no matter whether they're low income or some of the top lawyers in Washington, D.C., they've all had the talk. None of my white players have had that talk with their parents, and almost none of the white parents know the talk is even going on. So what I try to do in this book is to say, what's the old talk, why is that still going on, and what's the new talk that we need to have? How do we change our racial geography at the point of our schools, sports, and our congregations? How do we change that racial geography? How do we listen to and know and believe each other's stories? How do we cross the thresh thresholds of each other's lives and homes and understand, not just talking about race, talking about life. What do you, do you get changed by crossing that threshold? I tell a story in a book about, I remember when Rodney King, some of you older people remember Rodney King, beat up and videoed in California in a trial in Simi Valley. And I was out there, the World Council of Churches had a commission. Why did this happen? As if we didn't know. Uh, we had this dialogue in Simi Valley, a white Methodist and black Methodist, two churches talking together for the first time. I'll never forget a black mother who said, I worry about my son, who's a member of the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm worried when he takes off his uniform and goes undercover. And a white mother said, oh, I feel that, that the fear you must have when your son would take off that uniform and be exposed to those gangs. And the black mother said, no, no, it isn't the gangs, don't worry about it, it's the members of the white LAPD who would see my son without his uniform on. And we all waited to see if the white mother would believe the black mother. And there was silence in the room, and bless her heart, she did. She believed the black mother, and the whole conversation went deeper at that moment. The book is full of those kinds of stories. How do we, how do we change the conversation? And I want to say the conversation that the nation's having underneath this political conversation is one that's not being talked about. I, we can't get the media to talk about the real conversation going on. Here's what's underneath the headlines. This nation is changing dramatically, demographically, and by the middle of this century, we will no longer be a white majority nation. Already in Los Angeles and Chicago, where I just was, and, but we will be a majority of minorities. That's the new demographic, and when you see candidates running for president, who just fuel racial fear and hatred and poison our political atmosphere and environment. What they're really doing is trying to prevent that demographic from changing us. They want to veto it, delay it, prevent it, because a whole lot of older white Americans aren't ready for that change. And who is going to navigate these waters? My son, Jack, when he was younger, I, I remember his class was studying immigration. And two dads were involved. One was an immigration lawyer, and I was at that point doing a fast for immigration reform called Fast for Families with Eliseo Medina and a lot of other immigrants. And so I came too. And I remember sharing with my son's fifth grade class at the John Eaton Elementary School in Washington, D.C., 
how 11 million undocumented people um, weren't, couldn't get the medical care they needed or the police protection they needed, and many of their families were being broken up by a thousand deportations every day. And the kids looked at me, most of the boys in that room I coached in baseball, they said, why doesn't the Congress change that? Good question. Why don't they fix that? Have you talked to them? <laughs> Said, yeah, we've, we've had several conversations. <laughs> Why don't they fix it? And I said, because they tell me they're afraid. And the kid said, what are they afraid of? And then it hit me. It became the most important talk in immigration I ever gave because then it hit me. I looked at my sons, fifth grade class. They are African American. They are Latino. They are Asian American. They are Native American. They are white. They are Somali. They are Maltese. I said, they're afraid of you. They're afraid of you. Why are they afraid of us? Because they think you look like what America's becoming. They think you're the future of America. And they said, why are they afraid of that? That's because they don't think it's going to work. Tell me, I asked them, how's it working? Kids said, it's working great. It's really cool. It's, yeah, it's working great. And so, well, our job is to help teach this country that this is really great and really cool. I have been a critic, as some of you who are familiar with Sojourner's work, I have been a critic of this idea of American exceptionalism for a long time and the danger of that notion, what it's led to. But on one of our town meetings in New York, first one, Heather McGee of Demos, a wonderful organization, she's a wonderful uh, activist, and she said, you know, Jim, I'm thinking on the panel after she said, I'm thinking that if we could build this bridge to a new America that you're talking about, which is building, building a bridge where, where somehow privilege and punishment are not because of our skin color. Or as Professor Eddie Glaude of Princeton says in his new book, Democracy in Black, worth reading, by the way, um, democracy in black, brown, and white. If we could move to that kind of nation, Heather said, that would be the first real, genuine American exceptionalism. I agree with that. I like that. The hope in these conversations I'm feeling across the country that so many young people are joining and older people are saying, we want to be part of this too, is is how we can build that bridge. It's the longest chapter in the book. How can we build that bridge, change our racial geography, change, now we gotta change systems and policies, the whole chapter here and how you move from, as Brian Stevens says, police being warriors to guardians. Plato had this notion of the guardian being such a critical role in society. Serve and protect, side of the cars. Guardians are really important. What does it mean to move from warriors to guardians? How do we change? How do we restore voting rights? I, had, I got to walk up the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the anniversary, 50th anniversary recently. A number of us there, some of you were probably there too, and I got to walk up with the old foot soldiers who were there 50 years ago. John Lewis was still there, almost beaten to death on that bridge. They're in their walkers and wheelchairs. They're still marching up that bridge. I got to walk with them. And at the top, we're all in tears and hugging each other, and I asked myself, what is the bridge that my kids are gonna have to cross? They crossed that bridge for voting rights, gave their lives for it, uh, and now we still have to protect what they won because others want to take that away through, um, through um, uh, uh, voter suppression, through gerrymandering, through what uh, Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, which we write about that too, where uh, Brian says, slavery never ended, it's just evolved. 
and mass incarceration is the new evolution, which isn't just to incarcerate, but to disenfranchise millions of black men and women who come out of prison and can't vote. This isn't an accidental thing. Like racialized ghettos in our cities aren't an accidental thing. These are policies. These are policies. How do we take on those particular policies and change them? But I think building that bridge is going to be the road that a new generation is re ready to, to walk. And I see a new generation of young people ready to do that. So how do we move from the arguments over guilt, which are often silly, to talk of responsibility, to benefit from oppression, white privilege and all the rest, is to be responsible for changing it. It's a principle. To benefit from oppression means to be responsible for changing it. How do we become accomplices in a movement that says black lives matter? How do we, around the nation, commit to changing the water and changing the air? See, I believe we can do this it's going to take us all intersectionally across all of our sections, across a lot of boundaries. That's the conversation that a new generation of activists is really making possible for us to have. So I'm grateful to them for, for doing so. It raises the issue every time we go anyplace. The last question is always about hope. Is there hope? Well, Francis said, Pope Francis said, remember he said, we can change things. <laughs> We can change things, and he's doing it. We can change things. Hope is finally the issue, and I'll close because of my tradition. You know, I'm a preacher, so I gotta close with a text. The text is from Hebrews. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I know the evidence on mass incarceration, on policing, on education, on the economic system, I know the evidence. But you know, the faith community has always been those who offer not optimism, because that's often not really real or responsible. Hope is not a feeling or a personality type, it's a decision you make. Or as a bunch of young actors of Ferguson, those leaders said to 50 faith leaders we brought in, to retreat with them a year ago in December, the young activists looked at these prophetic church leaders and asked them one question. They said, what risks are you ready to take? What risks are you ready to take? So that Hebrews text, I have a paraphrase which I'll end with today. Hope means believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim Wallace. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Marcia Zimmerman and I am the senior rabbi of Temple Israel just up the road and a guest moderator of today's forum with Jim Wallace. We'll be taking questions from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Westminster THF, THF. And you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank the donors who make these programs possible, including MinPost, the media sponsor for the spring series, MinPost, is a reader-supported, nonprofit, nonpartisan source of Minnesota news. Look for them online at minpost.com. 
I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us here at Westminster Church for our next forum on Tuesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. when E.J. Dion will be our speaker. Reverend Wallace, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. Thank you. Don't you love when they say the ushers will bring forward your questions, not your money, but your questions. Okay. Has a black president helped or hurt this question? You know, um, this book is dedicated to one of my principal mentors, Vincent Harding, who was in Dr. King's Southern, Southern Freedom Movement inner circle. And he actually wrote King's speech against the Vietnam War at Riverside Church. And Vincent, uh, who's Uncle Vincent in my house, uh, got to come for the inauguration of Barack Obama. And uh, so we had the blessing of, of Vincent Harding explaining to my two boys the historical significance of the inauguration of this first black president. And Vincent has done some of the best history as a black historian of King from 63 to 68 and how he became more and more focused on this kind of change that we need. Um, Vincent and I were saying to each other on our back then, maybe, maybe America is, maybe the country's better than we thought it was when we said that to each other with the election. Iowa primaries, all young white voters for Obama. And I, I think that the president, I've, I knew Barack Obama when he was in Chicago, back then and, and since, I think even President Barack Obama was a little stunned by the pushback that he has received. And Barack Obama represents the new demographic that so many people are afraid of. So the Donald Trump begins with the birther campaign and saying, he is not one of us. It's one thing to disagree with policies, that's fine. He's not one of us. He is different from us, it is the beginning of where, where they started. So the pushback against the president personally, not just in terms of policy, is in fact indicative of the pushback to really the new demographic he represents. The president has just opened up all kinds of doors, and I'll tell you, in Charleston, the preface to the book's called June 17th. Uh, it was, Charleston happened after the book was done, Mother Emanuel on June 17th. And when the president went there and really spoke to that, to that service and broke into amazing grace at the end of his remarks, uh, I think he was really going very deeply into himself and his history and the black churches and showing what that amazing grace could look like. But I think the pushback we have seen is indicative of what it will take to build that bridge to a new America. Do you have any comment about the upcoming election? That is a question. <laughs> they wanted you to focus on GOP here. But. Well, clearly, um, if we're talking about what people are feeling around the country, there's a tremendous uh, uh, hunger for someone to speak to the issues of inequality. So at the Parliament of World Religions, which I got to speak to a few months ago, we had a session on inequality, and the discussion was about is the answer uh, redistribution, mobility, all of those fair questions. It struck me that that issue, the heart of the inequality, was in fact what happened on June 17th when here are older African-American Christians in the sacred space, the basement of their church, having a prayer meeting, and you know all the other shootings and alleged incidents, nobody was saying, well, you know, I didn't like the way they were looking at me. 
or they weren't looking at me. Or, or they were running toward me, or they were running away from me, or they were reaching for something. They were just saying prayers. Young man came in, and he was invited to pray with them, and then he shot and killed nine, nine of them, which made every black person in America feel that there's no place in America black people are safe. That's the fundamental inequality that we still have to, to deal with. And, and it's difficult to get the media or the candidates to talk about the state of race in America in 2016 in relation to this race. So at Sojourners, that's gonna be our primary focus all of this election year. Uh, that's the conversation we need to have openly, publicly, honestly, and transparently. And uh, I think that's a conversation many in the country are hungry to have. So this is a question I get a lot, and I would love your response. What are the ways that Black Lives Matter should use to make positive change? And then it goes on to say, shutting access to airports or highways, occupying police precinct buildings. So can you speak to that? Because I think many people who have white skin privilege are really struggling with that one. There is a white pastor in Chicago um, bless her heart, but she said to me, um, can we talk about racism and white privilege like you want us to do without making my church members so uncomfortable? <laughs> uh, I have a memory that in my tradition, Jesus tended to make people feel uncomfortable, particularly those who were in power, he made feel quite uncomfortable. And another comment was, you know, on Michigan Avenue in that Black Friday thing they did, they blocked off the streets and shopping downtown. And I said to one of the protesters, I said, I'm, I'm for you, I'm really for what you're for, but it's really inconvenient today because I wanted to buy an iPhone, and now I can't. <laughs> so these questions are kind of striking sometimes. And I said, uh, well, you know, do you have any members of your congregation who are African American? Yeah. Ask over coffee someday, ask if a, a black Christian, if racism has ever made their day uncomfortable um, or inconvenient. Um, what it means, uh, there's a whole section in the book here about white fragility. We white folks think that when we're uncomfortable, we're unsafe. Now, uh, how do we lean into the discomfort? and find our souls again. I have learned most in my life about the world by being places I was never supposed to be with people I was never supposed to meet or be with or listen to or learn from. So it's leaning into that discomfort that I think will be very uh, 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 healing for us in the, so, and remember, <laughs> um, Dr. King was engaged in nonviolent action, but it was confrontational nonviolence. Let's not forget that. So a woman who drove me to Selma from Birmingham, uh, lives in Birmingham, and she told me her story. She says, you know, uh, did you ever see the film The Help? My mother was one of those women, The Help, who was taking care of white, white folks home, 25 cents a day, five cents was for the bus backwards and forwards. But she and my dad, a, a minister, put us all through college. And so we were in school in Birmingham when Dr. King asked the children to come to the streets and march against Bull Connor's fire hoses and dogs, children. He asked to come to the streets. And the principals of this all black school said, no, no, shut the school down. And so. This woman who I met and was driving me to, the, to Selma. So we had to climb out the window of our schools and go to the streets to march with Dr. King. So this, this is, it's always going to be a new generation from lunch counters to, to uh, bus rides to, to now what's happening now. To, it's always going to be that, the, that the, we, we, we have to make clear what's going on and we all have to find our way into that conversation. So my notion of faith is you gotta uh, put it into practice. You gotta 
uh, take it to the streets of your lives, your workplace, your congregations, and how does it, how does it really change the way, we gotta change the narrative. It's gotta make us be inconvenienced and uncomfortable, and that's how change finally always has come. Can you offer us some hope and inspiration by citing examples where police departments are addressing racism and systemic injustice within their structures and implementing new models for working with people of color? Well, um, the policing commission that Brian Stevenson was on, Brittany Packnett was on that too, by the way. It's very powerful. It's, there's a whole chapter on this. It's worth reading. It's worth taking to your, your, uh, your police departments and mayors. It's really practical and very specific. I saw two events just last week, uh, two situations where uh, one was uh, uh, a police, a couple of police officers, uh, they, they came upon this civilian, they thought, uh, and he was African American, and they treated him very badly. And they, they learned later he was a police chief in their department. And they were disciplined right away, and they're facing some serious consequences because he was a police chief. Now, this is an example of, of, of white police treating uh, their black citizens very, very differently, wrongly. Same week, in another city, this cop gets called uh, because of the noise being made and disruption, disruption being done uh, by these young people playing basketball. So he showed up and these young people are playing basketball and he said, what's wrong with this? I'm not sure, can I play? <laughs> and he became, he be, got playing basketball and he actually was pretty good. This is a white cop, pretty good. And he said, can I bring some friends with me tomorrow to play basketball, will you be here? And I said, yeah, we'll be here. So he came with some friends from the police department the next day, and Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> to play basketball. And he said to those who called, there's another round of playing basketball. So I think there's all kinds of stories now where this is in the air, in the conversation. And as you know, some clergy have been involved in trying to be uh, uh, intermediaries occasionally between the streets and the people and the kids and the police department. So this is a conversation now that really is going all over the country and you can find bad examples and some hopeful examples, but I think it's a conversation that is really ultimately a very hopeful one. How do you reestablish trust in a community? How do you talk about being guardians? How do you, how do you do community policing? I know police officers who want to do that and others who are just seemingly very opposed to it. So how do we have those conversations? Finally, we all have to be accountable for our actions. And that's the principle we have to uphold. So this is indicative of many questions like it. How should young people engage in this conversation or bring it to places where it has been silenced? Young people, I would always, I always say, uh, trust your questions. Trust your questions, follow your questions to where they take you. And sometimes younger people have the, uh, the vocation, I, I would say, to sometimes raise the questions of those of us that get into our more comfortable, subtle categories of a harder time raising. That's part of their job. When young people aren't asking hard questions, they're not doing their job as young people, in my view. Now, that means then you have a conversation, and I see veterans who have been doing this work for years, paying the cost uh, in the black churches, lots of places, and I see young voices coming up, and, and that conversation is gonna be transforming, and it's gonna be around risk-taking. Uh, it's gonna be around, and not, not, not just in demonstrations, but in our workplaces, uh, in our, our congregations, in our places where we live and work and have influence, we got to make sure this conversation is occurring in all those places. And remember, conversation by itself that doesn't lead to action. We talked about before, this forum is, is about reflection, and rightly so. 
but reflection has to lead to action. So what concrete things are we gonna do? And the book talks about specific things that we can do in neighborhoods, communities, to put our, in fact, uh, conversation into action. I think we are concluding here. Thank you again, Reverend Wallace, please.